Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 2022 Alumni Festival. It's terrific to be able to host in-person events again and welcome you all back to Cambridge. And also I'd like to welcome the, the many that are on Zoom in the new format of online and in-person events together. Um, whether this is your first time at the festival or, or you've been many times previously, it's great to see so many of you coming back to enjoy these events. I very much hope you enjoy all the sessions you will be attending throughout the day. I'm Ian Roberts, an alumnus of St John's and a member of the Alumni Advisory Board. The board provides strategic advice to the university to help maximise the impact of alumni engagement programming. It is an important sounding board for the university to test and refine new initiatives aimed at building a deeper relationship of mutual benefit with its alumni. This morning, I have the pleasure to introduce you and welcome your speakers who will talk to you on the subject of public sociology and racial justice. Uh, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Manali Desai, uh, who is the head of the University Sociology Department. Thank you, Manali. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Well, good morning and welcome to um, our session on public sociology and racial justice. Um, we, uh, the panel, sort of came up with this idea of, of, a, um, of, the, of focusing on this particular topic, partly because over the past 10 years, the Department of Sociology has developed a kind of what I would call a signature style uh, of public sociology. And uh, we wanted to kind of give a flavor of the kind of research that we do in the department and the kind of ways in which it connects up with current issues, which are very alive, as you know, in British politics and across the globe as well. Um, the public sociology has been defined by um, the sociologist Michael Borowoy as a type of sociology that seeks a dialogic relationship between the sociologist, um, the practicing sociologist, which is what we are, and the many publics, the many different people out there in, the, in our communities who are all seeking to understand social inequalities and the consequences of social inequalities on people's lives. So part of what we do in our department, part of the signature is to develop a, um, you know, um, modes of research that are immersed in the particular communities that we study and are responsive to the concerns and the agendas that are co-created with these communities. So I would say that starting actually with, what, with the collegiate university, the department, members of the department on the panel here have uh, made significant contributions to understanding more about everyday racism, about um, decolonizing the curriculum. So let's start by mentioning um, Dr. Monica Figueroa and Dr. Ali Megji are both, have both been at one time, Monica was the previous race equality champion and Ali is currently one of the race, one of the two race equality champions in the university, and part of the work that they've done is to really have a, a very long and you know a lengthy listening exercise across the board across the university to to really understand how racial disparities and, and racism, everyday racism, impact the lives of people working in this university. So it's a really a huge amount of work that we've done in a voluntary capacity. And I just wanted to mention that as one of the many things that we have done in the department. Monica Figueroa and our other colleague, Ella McPherson, have all also developed a digital reporting tool called End Everyday Racism that seeks to collect uh, across the university of students and staff experiences of everyday racism. These can, you know, range, and Monica can tell you perhaps a bit more about it, but these can range from all kinds of um, daily forms of harassment that often go unnoticed and unreported because there are no tools currently for uh, reporting that kind of um, experience, which is, uh, which, and they have collected, I don't know how many um, instance, uh, yeah. in instances across the university. Um, Ali, Megji, Monica, and myself have also been involved in um, efforts around decolonizing the curriculum. And uh, we have within the department a committee called Decolonizing Sociology that um, more recently Ali has been leading, uh, which really looks at the curriculum that we teach within sociology and trying to increasingly and continually uh, make it relevant to the concerns of students in particular who are really um, you know, wanting to know more about the kind of colonial origins of sociology and how it impacts the type of sociology that we undertake, the type of research that we undertake. 
Um, there is also another project within the department led by Professor Sarah Franklin called the Black British Voices Project, which is the first ever survey of Black British lives um, that has ever been undertaken. And the results of that survey will be published, I think, fairly soon. So this is just a flavor of the type of work we've been doing. Because uh, last but not least is Monica Figueroa's involvement with the Legacies of Slavery Inquiry. And many of you will have noted that the report was released on Thursday. Perhaps you've already seen it, but if you haven't, I would urge that you um, go and have a look at that. Broadening out from this work that we've done within the collegiate university, we in the department have um, consolidated a, a significant amount of expertise on race uh, across the globe, anti-racism and intersecting inequalities, uh, forms of marginality and exclusion. And we have an MPhil pathway that's dedicated to the study of marginality and exclusion as well. Part of our ambition um, is to um, actually further consolidate and build on these strengths to create an institute called RAISE, which is, uh, a, it's an acronym, a, a long acronym. I won't, I won't read out the whole, um, the, the entire title to you, but anyway, we are currently uh, initiating fundraising efforts for this. I really want to draw that, your attention to that. The idea would be to enable a more consolidated and concentrated and effective dialogue, um, outreach and engagement uh, with communities, non-academic partners, and to use participant-led data gathering to explore the mechanisms of racial injustice and social inequality. And um, so the three speakers today uh, we'll give you a more in-depth idea of the kind of research they do and the work that they've been doing. Um, I will introduce you in, I will introduce them to you in the order in which they will speak. So Dr. Monica Figueroa, who's uh, going to speak first, works on issues of race and anti-racism in Latin America. She's leading a British Academy funded project on institutional racism in Mexico and has uh, in the past led a large ESRC funded research project uh, titled Latin American Anti-Racism in a Post-Racial Age. And she has many other projects, which I think she will be speaking about, um, hopefully perhaps today, at least give you a flavor of them. Next to her is Dr. Rachel Sanchez Rivera, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Sociology. And they work on eugenics, racism, reproduct reproductive justice, critical race theory, and disability studies, among other areas. And finally, um, Dr. Ali Megji has written uh, a significant number of books given his early career, the early career stage at which he is. Um, he has written on the black elite across South Africa and the United States and Britain, the global roots, the black sociological tradition. He has published books on race and social theory, critical race theory, and he has a new book. I think he's just finished the proofs of a book uh, coming out with Temple University Press on the study of race and world crises. So without further ado, I will let the speakers take about 10 to 12 minutes each, and I will take questions at the end of the three talks um, and very much welcome your views on what you've heard. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Manali. So um, well, my name is Monica Moreno Figueroa. I'm going to, I've been here since 2014. I was before at Newcastle, before at Nottingham, before at Goldsmiths where I studied and I'm Mexican. i um, been here 23 years now. And during this time, I came to study racism really by the impact of being at Goldsmiths first. And then just from that and my studies there, um, I started just consolidating that pathway. I'm being very interested in understanding what I call the quality of the experience of racism. Could you take me the 10 minutes? Okay. But what I call the quality of the experience, you know, what does it feel like? What does it mean? How does it cross people's lives to be both in the receiving end and also in the unaware, maybe sometimes unawaring, unaware um, position of affecting others, you know, being oppressive to others. And how does that work? So I'm very interested in those dynamics. But I'm also, I was also uh, looking at when I start thinking about racism in Mexico, particularly, um, how 
uh, it was really a very arid, very, very few people were doing that study. There was now there is like a boom almost. But at the time, I mean, 20 years ago, very few people were studying. So there was also a need of broadening it up. So I'm going to tell you the different things I've done, just some of them, so you get a sense of how, you know, what, what are the topics I've researched, but also what kind of things I teach and we do at the department. So this first study of the, of the what does it feel like, I did uh, concretely on what I call like the everyday life of racism for Mexican women. And I, I studied women in three different, four different cities actually of the country. It just tried, it was very an exploratory thing. I was like, have you experienced racism? What is it? What is it like? How it has been for you? And women that just identify as Mexicans, right? Not women that said I'm indigenous or I'm black or I'm, no, it's just like pure and simple people that would say I'm Mexican. And that was very interesting because it led me to this understanding of what is the cultural sort of an ideological context that allows some people to, that allow us all to explain um, what we live through, you know, in, in specific in terms of race in this case, but generally we can speak about the, the systems and projects that are in place culturally speaking or, you know, broadly speaking. In this case, um, it was very interesting to see that there are very different racial projects around the world, you know, and every area will have its racial project. And broadly, we can divide them in racial projects of assimilation and projects of segregation. So places like South Africa, the UK, the US, the Europe, have more of a kind of projects of segregation where people are, uh, there's ideas about purity, you know, that racial purity and that people shouldn't mix and that there's like white people there, black people there, Etc. Not separated. Um, sometimes separated geographically. You know, separated by law, separated by just traditions and customs and ways of doing things. Whereas Latin America, I don't know if you ever visited any place of Latin America. The projects there is of assimilation. So mixture is at the core of those societies, and it's branded as like the citizen, the ideal citizen of these countries is the mixed citizen, the one that embraces its indigenous heritage, its European by Spain or Portugal heritage. And, and that becomes like the ideological way that it is presented to people. And this is called mestizaje, which is, means mixture. And it's really interesting once you start kind of looking at how mestizaje, how this ideology and project kind of works in the everyday. So people will make choices, you know, about how to improve the race because it's a project of mixture that has, um, it's like a whitening project that say, we're gonna mix, but we're gonna mix to improve, you know, to become a better, a better citizen. And that better citizen is a whiter citizen. So you can see those ideas working through, through the, through the country, through the different places. So that was like the first thing I wanted to look at how that mestizaje, which I then called mestizaje logics or race, racist logics operate in everyday life, how people will make decisions about from who they marry, what kind of um, hair the color they will put uh, in their, you know, in the beauty practices. Uh, who would they hire, etc. And also like the ways in which this, this project works. Um, I then, um, that uh, one of the results of the project, which was very unexpected for me was the issue of beauty. I was working with women, I was using photographs and the study of beauty and racism, well, beauty itself, first for feminism and gender studies has been like quite an important thing. And it was really interesting when I started looking at it because many people thought that was the most banal thing to do. It's like, who cares about if someone feels pretty or doesn't feel pretty and if what, you know, if you dress up or not, if you put makeup or not, or what, what's that to do with social life, right? Or with sociology or a sociological interest. But I mean, it is quite central. I mean, you ask anybody, I'm sure you all look at yourself in the mirror before you left your houses or your places. You look if you have at least the socks, the same pair, um, you know, that, you know, your hair was at somewhere like down or something. And, and that is just like, we care about appearance. We care about how we look and we are, 
it crosses our everyday, our, how we judge, how we appear to the public, what is decent. I was looking, is this decent enough for this occasion? Should this shoe, should I, you know, that bit, bit of the morning of like, what should I wear? It's not a thing, although it seems very everyday, it is a way of organizing our bodies. And for women, it's particularly grueling. For women of color, it's even more because how racial ideas have been organized is that if you are the darker you are, the uglier you are, right? And that idea, which is has been, you know, you if you see this, I don't know the numbers, but if you see the cells of whitening creams around the world, the effect they have. I mean, there is this idea that you have to become whiter, and that so that's a, ve a very interesting area. So from just asking people, how do you feel about your body? You know, do you like your body? Do you like yourself? Well, you can just open up a whole amount of not only hurts and experiences, but also ideas about how our societies, oh, sorry, I touched the microphone, um, how our societies, um, yeah, divide us and organize us around our body. So that has been a very important core area of study. And I like teaching these very much to students. We talk about cosmetic surgeries and how cosmetic surgeries are also very racialized. You know, there's is that the, the nose job is about, you know, uh, for example, in Brazil, they call it the operation of the negroid no nose, which is like to take that away, you know, you know, you have a, an Asian um, Chinese and Japanese communities like Taiwan, the, the double eye like surgery. So there is a lot of ideas of race crossing the body and, and beauty stuff. So that's something I've done as well. And then, but then I felt like I was doing very micro things, you know, that these were like, you know, the everyday that, that, that I needed to do something a bit also different to complement. And I went and did a study on institutional racism and or state racism. It was a little bit more like challenging for me because I was moving from these conversations about the everydayness and this quality of life to a bigger, bigger bigger, well, not, not bigger in terms of better, but bigger in terms of macro relations. So I did a study on um, in Mexico about access to resources, to water specifically, and another to access to health, looking at the case of a woman who, an indigenous woman who was injured while she having, was having her birth, uh, having a baby, and she was put wrong this injection and she was left paralyzed and without any responses. I mean, alive, but she couldn't speak or engage. And her baby was born, but then she was left like that. So that analyzing that case, we went to see all the conditions from that you can say, while well, you can blame the doctor, which has actually was a junior doctor just recently graduated doing their practice in this hospital where there was only one doctor in a very remote village supervising 60 students that will come and practice on indigenous peoples. So can you blame a doctor? And then you have a situation where there's no medicine, there's no hospitals, the roads are un they don't work. The hospitals are very full, et cetera. So you see that and you compare it to other areas of the country where there, that doesn't happen, you, you, you can start making deductions and you think about who matters you know, for the state, where the resources go, why is not distributed evenly. I mean, that is not unique of Mexico, of course, that even maybe happens here as well. Uh, but that idea of the the racialized geographies, racialized services, and who gets to be uh, provided with access to a good life and who doesn't. That's something that we came out of that study, as well as the other part of it that was looking at water and access to water um, and what we call you know, environmental racism. Um, I don't know how my time is up. Couple of minutes. So I'll tell you just about my my last project, which is um, this one called we call it La Pora, Latin American Anti Racism in a Post Racial Age. So after looking at institutional racism and this every day, I was like, okay, we established racism exists. Now I want to look at what are we doing about it? What are the anti racist practices that these uh, situations and these actions have developed on? Taking into account what we say like a multicultural turn and um, 
an anti-racist sort of turn in, in particularly in Latin America where governments and organizations were aware racism was happening. So there were starting to be many actions against racism. So we did this project looking at four countries in Latin America. This was a big ESRC around one, more than 1 million pounds funding for it, looking at practices and discourses of anti-racism in these four countries, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Mexico. And it was so interesting to see the array of activity, organizations, government initiatives, legal cases, activists, social movements. And we tried to map out in a way what has been done, what works, what hasn't worked, and to what extent things work. You know, rather than being very kind of strict, like this is a good anti-racist action and this is bad. We are trying to map it out to see what are the elements that make things more or less successful and that how that has to do mainly with the understanding of racism that is behind each anti-racist action. So if people think racism is just someone being mean and you know they had, you know, they are an uneducated and they just need to be, you know, um, yeah, taught what is to be a good person. That's one thing, and, and that would release a series of actions. But if the understanding of racism is that is structural, that it has to be with how society is organized, how, where the money is, how things are distributed, then the actions have to be commensurate to that. So that's more or less a project. The book came out March this year. It's called Against Racism, Organizing for Social Change in Latin America. It's a beautiful book, super well written. It's really entertaining. <laughs> I really recommend you to look at it. And um, yeah, so that's been the last. And I'll be now working on a project on internalized racism. I'm going back to my first uh, ideas of the experience. And I'm going to be looking at how some of us believe we are better than others. And some of us believe we are less than others. And how does that happen? How we internalize these hierarchies that people are organized separately um, in these racial ideas. So more or less. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. So hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming, especially on a Saturday morning. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my work and why is it relevant to public sociology. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about critical eugenic studies and its legacies as well as um, like my work uh, in more public sociology and what do we do to highlight these issues. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about the different definitions of eugenics uh, and then eugenic societies and eugenic projects and then I'm going to be talking about the legacies of eugenics and contemporary uh, history. Um, so basically defined as the science of the well-born, eugenic was intended as a social program that dedicated or was dedicated to the improvement of racial stocks. Uh, Galton coined the term eugenics in 1883, and it's about this time that it began to attract widespread uh, interest as a social uh, philosophy. Uh, the eugenics movement within European nations like, wanted to ensure that the best white stock uh, within a nation prevailed. Uh, this was in line with fear that the Catholic Irish and the white working class uh, were breeding uh, too much as like, poverty was seen as um, innate moral inferiority. Uh, it also influenced with the rising intensity of imperialist feeling uh, from the 1880s, uh, helping to build nationalist sentiment and providing a convenient rationale for the colonial subjugation of non-Europeans. Uh, at one level, eugenics reflected a triumphant uh, confidence in the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race, particularly the upper and middle classes. Um, However, at the same way, um, it also reflected a deep sense of vulnerability uh, and fear among the Victorian uh, classes. Uh, the prospect of a reversal in evolutionary progress suggests that Western civilization was threatened with the decline that it could only be revived through the adoption of drastic uh, measures. 
so notions of degeneration and deterioration often conflating fears arising, uh, rising out from race and class tension perver uh, pervade uh, the eugenic literature in the sense like it was like eugenics and the popularization of eugenics was infused with an air of catastrophism. Um, so eugenics was divided into two main strands, uh, positive eugenics and negative eugenics. That doesn't mean that one of them is good and one of them is bad. Both of them are bad, and I want to make that very clear. Uh, but basically, positive eugenics was a series of measures that encouraged the people who were constructed as free, fit to reproduce through different marriage certificates, uh, migratory measures that incentivize uh, different groups uh, to come into X, Y, Z uh, country, because this varied according uh, to context, among many other measures. Uh, like for instance, in the U.S., like there was there were this uh, contest, uh, contest, sorry, that were called the fitter family contests uh, to prove like who belonged to the best stock. Um, so this was a series of tests that these families would actually voluntarily go through, uh, and they would rate them in A, B, C, D, F, similar to the United States like education system, and we can talk about that um, later. But it was by virtue of their capacity to do sports, their lineage, their verbal and mathematic reasoning, among many other tests, because this lasted for one to three days. Like the first one was in Kansas, and that one lasted for about a day but then it spread all over the midwest and the rest of the united states and like those tests like usually like uh went on for about three days but then the fitter family that would win this contest like would even get their like picture in in the newspaper and they become like super famous and all of this stuff um but yeah the u.s is a bit weird um what <laughs> celebrity <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much celebrity family um in turn, uh, negative eugenics uh, were different measures that restricted those considered unfit in, inside of this eugenic uh, reasoning from reproducing uh, through the limitation of uh, migration of those considered undesirable, uh, forcing or sterilization practices, which I will uh, talk further later, which were very common in, in the United States contest, as we will see with the example of Puerto Rico and California later on. Uh, but basically what I want to take from this is that this mostly affected people of color, uh, people with disability, working class people, and gay and lesbians, as well as trans and non-binary people, which at this point uh, were considered abnormal or feeble-minded or in need of fixing. Um, so I think one of the things that I need to say is that eugenics was a very common science. It was a very common practice and it was considered very mainstream and it was very modern and in keeping up with the times. So much so that different countries and there I say most countries in the world uh, had a eugenic society, uh, which was composed of very influ influential people from all disciplines, like from biology all the way down to journalism. Um, so, uh, for example, the eugenic uh, society in the United States was very, very influential. And then in Mexico, uh, they also had uh, the Mexican Society of Eugenics, but this was all over the world and they usually like had transnational connections. For example, there were different eugenicists like from Romania that were part of like eugenic, like eugenic societies in Mexico or in Argentina and Chile, like and same with the United States context. Um, apart from the societies, this eugenics, uh, eugenicists like, would greatly contribute to different policies and practices in their own countries. They would implement both positive and negative eugenics according to their own context. For example, in India, like, they had a very aggressive population control and eugenic um, population plan all throughout the 20th century. And in Turkey during the 1930s, um, like, uh, eugenics was being used as a way of modernizing the nation and in keeping up uh, with the times. Also in China, the one-child policy was also eugenically motivated. However, not all eugenic, uh, eugenics and eugenic practices uh, were the same, even if there was some overlap and some dialogue between them. Um, so it was not until the final solution and the genocidal atrocities committed, committed by Nazi Germany during the Second World War that a widespread combination of race science, especially eugenic ideas, emerged. 
Uh, the 1950s UNESCO meeting was the first international attempt to stop using the word race and start using the, the word uh, ethnic groups. Uh, nonetheless, like racial groupings remain as Ashley Montagu, which was the original drafter of uh, the Statement on Race in 1950, argued that there were three main categories of humanity with different subdivisions and varieties of ethnic groups uh, beneath them. So this statement received major, major, major international backlash. So the UNESCO issued yet another statement on race in 1951 with ethnic groups and ethnicity functioning as euphemisms for race, which could lead one to erroneously infer that race and racial categories did not matter anymore. So efforts to invisibilize the term race erased the long history of racialization processes um, and stripped away the language necessary to challenge them in the first place. Thus, like while the term race uh, tended to fall from race or started to fall from race in this like specific point in time, uh, as a biological category, the UNESCO statement reinscribed uh, the notions embedded in race science through a different uh, terminological uh, tool set. <clears throat> so this all uh, called uh, retreat of scientific racism or retreat of eugenics marks a change over in race thinking. Uh, by the late 1960s, colorblind racism acquired a certain sense of cohesiveness and authority. Under colorblind racism, according to Eduardo Bonilla Silva, whites have developed powerful explanations which have ultimately become justifications for contemporary racial inequality that exculpate them from any responsibility for the status of people of color. So I think we have seen this countless times. But the major like popular uh, attempt was uh, the uprisings like caused by the murder of George Floyd. So colorblind racism allows for the usage of methodologies and ideas developed during the period of scientific racism without using the terms that are now cataloged as a pseudoscience. So this dynamics allow for the creation, maintenance, and resurgence of different ideas like during the period of the rise of eugenics and scientific racism more generally. And I think we can see that like from the apartheid in South Africa from 1948 to 1990s, as well as segregation policies in Canada. For example, the last racially segregated school in Nova Scotia closed in 1983 in Guysboro country. Same uh, in the United States uh, con uh, context, uh, Jim Crow segregation policies and practices were implemented from the 19th centuries um, all the way to the mid 1960s. Um, and it is important to say that segregation went beyond uh, uh, water fountains and segregated schools and bosses, which is horrible enough already. Um, but Patrick Wolf in his book, Traces of History, state that this goes beyond this practice as it, it allowed for the killing and the maiming of people that were outside of whiteness. So it is important to understand that this segregation laws and practices go to the point of the humanizing individuals and furthermore, they are systemic as they are endorsed by the status quo. So even if this finished in the 1960s, the segregatory system is still very much present in the systemic dimensions of white supremacy and anti-blackness. Um, so despite this laws like were supposedly eradicated, we see that like this practices allow segregation practices nowadays. Uh, so like the question still remains, like was there really a retreat of scientific racism? Is eugenics like eradicated or did we just find a new language to keep uh, putting down like people of color and black people? Uh, okay. Uh, Sorry, got too excited. Um, so I think in this sense, like one of the most contemporary examples like would be the forced hysterectomies in ICE detention centers in 2020, which unfortunately like nothing has happened uh, from it. And one of the things like, uh, just to wrap up, um, in light of the different social inequalities and structural injustices that it is um, that still happen nowadays. It is our job as sociologists to go beyond our own research that only my mommy and my supervisor are gonna read. Uh, so reproductive justice was coined uh, by black feminists and activists in the mid 1990s with the support of, um, uh, at least here with the support of the British Sociological Association. Um, 
Reproductive Sociology Research Group in the Department of Sociology, as well as the British Academy, we have founded the Reproductive uh, Justice Research Network, which has been running for a year, so it's only a baby still. But this group uh, runs a series of seminars in which we invite different um, activists and scholars, like interest in like highlighting like this long history of reproductive injustices. Uh, and we are holding in April our first annual conference titled Reproductive Justice in a Post COVID world, transnational protest and resistance. In addition to this, with the support of the Institute of Latin American Studies, uh, the University of London, the University of Kent, and sociology here in Cambridge, uh, we, has, he, we have also done a podcast like titled Cuerpa Politica, which is dedicated to the quest of reproductive justice in Latin America. So both of these efforts are a way of highlighting structural inequalities in uh, regards to reproduction in a more accessible manner, like YouTube videos, as well as podcast episodes and I'm going to leave it here. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> well, well. At least your mum does read your work. My, <laughs> my parents think I do theology. <laughs> um, so on the theme of public sociology and social justice, I think that um, sociology can and has made significant contributions to various public interventions. Uh, Rachel and Monica's talks gave us just some examples of that, but it's also something that has a much longer history. And I think likewise, it works in the other direction. So many movements for racial justice have shaped key sociological work and key sociological themes. Um, and that's kind of what my own research is about. So in my own research project, which is currently underway, I look at this through examining the work of classical black sociologists in the 19th and 20th centuries, all of whom were also public intellectuals, such as Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, Franklin Fraser, St. Clair Drake, and Adelaide Cromwell. And in some of my other work, I've looked at how social movements such as the Zapatistas in Mexico through their practice of pluriversality, or the Black Panthers in the States through their concept of intercommunalism, intercommunalism can help us sociologically study key crises of our time. This is the book that Manali was talking about, which comes out next year. And if I can get maybe three people to buy it, then I can get one cup of coffee <laughs> by the royalties. Um, so today what I want to do is just spend a really short time to focus on one of my favorite intellectuals who I just mentioned, W.E.B. Du Bois. He was a formative black intellectual born in the US, writing in the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, and maybe some people are familiar with him, a few people. So Du Bois was the co-founder of the first empirical school of sociology in the West in Atlanta, Georgia, which was co-founded in 1895. This school became known as the Atlanta Sociological Laboratory. But the Atlanta Sociological Lab was not set up to just publish journal articles um, on typewriters that would be hidden behind paywalls, which is kind of what we do now. Um, they weren't concerned with publishing books with top university presses. They weren't um, setting out to impress colleagues at international conferences or any of those kinds of things. Um, they were set up to produce rigorous social scientific studies of problems affecting black people in US inner cities, problems of educational segregation, health inequalities, unemployment, underemployment, and hyper-incarceration. The premise of this school was essentially to produce knowledge that would empower Black people in the States as they fought for racial equity in the face of legally enshrined racism. And let's not forget that at the same time that they were doing this sociological work, mainstream social science was publishing pathological depictions of Black social life Francis Galton, who Rachel mentioned, for example, was publishing his work in sociology journals. Um, so Du Bois is a case in point for someone who can be seen as a prototypical critical public sociologist. He co-founded and co-led the NAACP, an organization many of us are familiar with in the present day. He co-organized a series of Pan-African Congresses, along with other anti-colonial intellectuals, such as George Padmore, who was living here in the UK. Are there any people from Finsbury Park or adjacent here? <laughs> you can go to the New Beacon Books and upstairs there's the George Padmore Institute, which is really interesting if you have time to spare. Um, and indeed, Du Bois ended up being buried in Ghana after he was exiled from the US due to his relations with communism and socialism. Uh, an anecdote I like to share with my students is that it was no coincidence that he ended up being buried in Ghana. 
he found refuge there due to his close relationship with Kwame Nkrumah, another anti-colonial intellectual prominent in the critical social sciences, who became the first president of independent Ghana. Simply put, Du Bois ended up in Ghana because while he spent his life as a dedicated card-holding sociologist, he was a foundational figure for 20th century decolonization. Importantly, his sociological contributions were not separate from his involvement in decolonization, as I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. So Du Bois is such a good figure to talk about because so much of his work is actually freely accessible to anyone who has access to the internet. The University of Massachusetts Amherst has digitalized his archival documents, meaning that most of us, all of us in this room that have access to the internet can actually access thousands of his writings. Um, but much of their sociological work, so much of those writings that you'll encounter on this archive, were focused firstly on the role of racism in the US to the wider workings of empire across the world, and secondly, on how the world system maintained the relative stability post decolonization in the 40s and 50s. Um, so in this first frame, the frame which focused on racism in the States, books like Black Reconstruction highlighted how the exploitation of black labor in the US was, in his words, the foundation stone of the English factory system of European commerce of buying and selling on a worldwide scale. To clarify what he was talking about, um, we can think about a product such as cotton, which was seen as uh, part of the success story of British industrialization. Around 80% of the cotton that was produced via plantation slavery in the US was exported to England, where it was spun and then worked on before being exported to the colonies. So around 50% of Britain's cotton that was imported was then exported to India and um, a significant proportion also to the Caribbean. The whole point here is that what started off as plantation slavery in the States came to England to fuel the cotton industry, where they would then export the products to places which previously were leaders in the cotton industry themselves, such as India. So they were using exports in the colonies to destroy indigenous markets. So Du Bois's point, which seems relatively uncontroversial to many of us here, and which remains unbelievably crucial in the era of BLM and social movements transmissible by social media, his point is that racism in the US is not just an issue contained by the geographical borders of the US. It relates to wider political and economic processes that shape the world more broadly. Um, very quickly, in terms of his work on decolonization, I really recommend going to that archive and looking at his piece, The Status of Colonialism. It's only two or three pages long. Um, so it's here that he argues that decolonization was essentially a myth as the economic system which was born in colonialism still survived post decolonization. In his own words, there are many countries which have nominal independence, which are under almost as complete control by other nations as formerly, and thus that decolonization entails a change in method of control, but not real change in the facts or rigor of results. For example, the Philippines, Cuba and Puerto Rico, as well as Haiti and the Domin Dominican Republic are at the absolute mercy of American industry, commerce and banking. Cuban sugar, Haitian coffee, and Dominican products are sold at prices and in quantities which New York bankers dictate. Tin from Bolivia, coffee from Brazil, gold from South Africa, copper from Rhodesia, and uranium from the Congo are all under foreign control, and the native populations have their income and way of life dictated by powers outside their political control. That quote is quite long, but it reminds me of companies now, companies like Nestle, who were found to be using child labor in Ghana their excuse being that they couldn't afford to pay adults to do the labor for them in Ghana. That was the same year that they recorded a 7% increase in their profits. It reminds me of you know, Ford Motors or Tesla who are using uh, child labor in Congo um, it, it, to, to mine cobalt. It reminds me of all of these things which still happen in the 21st century, which we can talk about just now. Um, but I'll just conclude by saying that Du Bois showed us that a sociology which is not oriented towards wider publics is not a sociology. A sociology that isn't interested in social justice is not sociology, and that a disinterested sociology is an ineffective sociology. In his own words, one cannot be a calm, cool, and detached scientist, while Black people were lynched, murdered, and starved. Du Bois began writing over a century ago, and for so many reasons that we could all talk about for so much longer, so many of his ideas continue to be Prussian into the present day. But for time being, I'll just summarize my main point that Du Bois showed that sociology is a public social science, and that as a public social science, it is one of our most vital tools in fighting against local and global racialized inequalities. Right. Thanks so much. Marie.
Okay, well, we have uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions. So given that time is short, what I'm going to propose is we take a couple of questions at a time um, so as to give people a chance. And we um, also have an online audience where questions might be coming through. So who would like to start? And we will be using, Ian will go around with the microphone just for the benefit of our online um, audience. So that the people online can hear the question. So, Dr. Figueroa, you were talking. I was, I was interested about the um, uh, segregation versus assimilation uh, and the racism. And the, the assimilation is one I'm not familiar with. Not familiar with Mexico. Is that a um, you know? Is is the point about the assimilation that actually, although it's in theory bringing everyone together in in practice, it's just saying this is a model. And if you are, for example, an indigenous person, you need to move to this model and abandon your, your roots and history. Um, or are you really just excluded from that model because, because of your roots and history? Yes. Uh, do we take another one? Or should um, take let's take one more, I think, and then because it might be for you. Who knows? No, four. Well, yeah, okay. Thank you. It's sort of a question. Where does being mixed fit into your thinking? And is that the solution? I, well, they are connected yeah. in a way. Um, okay, so, I mean, and sometimes I say, I put it bluntly, very in a very broad strokes. You can think that the colonial projects had different ideas. So that, for example, the British colonial projects um, where we're gonna, um, well, no, the Spanish and Portuguese colonial projects where in order to have your land, I'm going to have your children. So I have your children and your land and everything. And then we're just like, we're part of this. Whereas the British would be, I'm going to have your land, excuse me, move, <laughs> disappear, the, die, whatever, whatever. Now, there were many different. So this, this idea of mixing with the people of the place that was conquered and colonized was seen as a very difficult thing. And there were all the, what we understand by racism is all that ideological way of justifying why not. No, it is because. So whereas um, the, what happened in Latin America, and not just Mexico, all of Latin America, was that a very big process of mixing happened. It was first encouraged between conquistadors and the indigenous elites and the, the daughters of, it was mostly by, by, by men, men, colon, men colonizers. And then it, when it became a much bigger thing, it was sometimes prohibited by the church, but then just trying to get organized by the, the, the legal and the authorities. And not that it was promoted, but that was sort of what happened at the end because of that. Um, that. So then you have that reality, that reality by the 17th century in Latin America, you couldn't tell who was the daughter of who or the kid of who because of that amount of mixture that had happened. So when racial ideas get reformulated in terms of scientific racism, it was, it was very difficult to say, what, are we going to get rid of all the people? How do we get rid of all the people here and to leave which are the pure and which are not the pure? And so then this idea of mixing came, which uh, with eugenics, I mean, there was like, the, okay, let's mix them. Let's bring Europeans to mix towards the white end. Let's not, for example, there were initiatives of not allowing Asian Chinese people in, Jewish people in, we want the right white kind, you know, Christians. And so what you have in places, well, most of Latin America, but you can see it more clearly in Argentina and Chile was like big in Costa Rica, big migrations of white Europeans that go there and mix with the population, you know, literally like that. So you have whiter people than other people. So the idea there is then the indigenous, so it becomes then a whole ideological proposal. So indigenous people, black people, they want to mix. Right? And that's how it was. It's a whole project of education around mixture towards the whiter end. No? So it was, although it's mixture, it's not a mixture that is benign. And that's kind of one of misunderstanding of Latin America, particularly Brazil, that is so like, oh, we have this um, racial democracy where everyone is mixed and we all love each other and we are all like, you know, one sole nation. That's the, the, that's the sort of carrot on the stick for everybody. You know, like, oh, you mix, you be 
become part. And that's how it's sold. And many people are, oh, look, at, oh my God, look how people love each other. And it's so nice. And mixed, mixed kids are so pretty. I mean, there's all that sort of exoticization of mixture. But what happens is that it's a certain kind of mixture in a particular direction that goes away from blackness and darkness and indigenousness towards whiteness. And that is how it's organized. So it's a sort of deceiving idea of that mixture is gonna be what takes us away from, um, because it also it's based on the idea that if you have mixture it's because you have purity. So the racial notion still exists, you know? So we have these pure bits that we're gonna mix and this mixed person is it, gonna be better. No, there was this guy called Vasconcelos in the 1920s who wrote the cosmic race. And he said, you know, that the citizen is this cosmic mixture, but it is a mixture that then erases the indigenous, doesn't speak indigenous language, speaks Spanish, da, 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 da. So there's a mixture that can be deceiving because it's an attractive, inclusive project, but it's actually a racist project. Other questions. Maybe there are other, any other questions? I'm really conscious of time. I think we only have five minutes left. Oh, There's, sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's... Oh, yeah. um, maybe this is actually too broad a question for how much time we have left. So sorry if I can't really answer it. But um, you were talking about, you know, what, what Tesla and Nestle and, and Ford, are, uh, you know, are doing now in foreign countries, but why, why does it seem to be the case that it's, 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 it's always people of color who are, who are, you know, uh, the victims of, of capitalism, even today, you know, why, why is it the case that, that racism and capitalism seem to be so, so inextricably tied up with one another? It's a great, it's not, not a very broad question. We, we are, anyway, I'm just to say it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Do we just take Who wants to take, I think yeah. it's meant to be. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we'll just take that one and then we'll, because yeah, time's short. It's definitely a really good question. Um, there are loads of resources that you can read about, which, uh, you know, also highlight it. So I mentioned the Du Bois archives, but um, the Connected Sociologies program, co-led by Gaminda Bambra is, is a good resource or global social theory as well is a really good resource for that. Um, but it's the whole point of post-colonial sociology is that it says that in 1492, where you get the beginnings of colonialism in Latin America, um, you get the creation of a total capitalist world system. What Spain and Portugal discovered were loads of silver and gold, the resources which were the most, let's call them expensive at that time in a world system. Prior to that colonization, India and China had tons of gold and silver, so they were the leaders in the global political economy. And then they got displaced because um, the Spanish and Portuguese empires were using the forced labor of indigenous people or the forced expropriation of their land in order to gain all of these materials. They were then able to fund uh, further expeditions and then you get this kind of like clash of the European empires. So Britain goes uh, to India via the East India Company as well. You kind of have corporations based there which are getting spices and materials and so on. You get the whole transatlantic slave trade, as I was using the example of Du Bois, he showed how slavery was basically a key, um, a, a key economic thing that was happening in the global political economy. So what you have basically is 300 years from 1400s to the 1700s of this is how we're gonna make the world system work. And it created what we call two levels of dependency. And I'll just do that in one minute because I know that you've got time. But the dependency works two ways because you have a really small center of the global political economy. Some people call it the West, some people call it the global North. Nowadays, we, it's kind of a bit more complicated, but it's still a very small center. And the rest of the world is dependent upon them because all of their exports go to them, right? Because they are where the markets are based and they are where the corporations are based. But the dependency also goes the other way because if those people refuse to work in the peripheries, in the, in the peripheries, which are ironically the majority of the world, if they refuse to work, nothing gets done in the center. So for example, what you saw with the Haitian revolution in Haiti, which was a Saint-Domain, which was a French colony, they refused to work. Therefore, France couldn't get all of their sugar, which was basically how the French empire was so rich. And it had global reverberations. So it's a similar kind of logic. 
in that um, the centre becomes dependent on the periphery because without the exploitation of cheap labour, they can't make profits in the centre. Does that make sense? So that's kind of why it's racialized, is because you had 300 years of setting it up, and then you basically created a whole global political economy with those two levels of dependency. And may I add that then you need this very strong ideological idea, ideologies of people in the peripheries need the validation of people in the center. So people of color, you know, get completely sort of smashed with these ideas that, you know, of worthlessness, that's why beauty is important. You know, if people don't feel that they're, well, for example, no, their bodies are worth for themselves and for others, well, then you just do, how are you going to be politicized? How are you going to get organized? And how are you going to say, actually, I'm not going to do that work for you anymore? Oh, so. I mean, I, I often use this map when I'm teaching around this, because if you look at sort of um, the spread of indicators around health, mortality, poverty, etc., it maps so well onto older colonial relations of core periphery relationships, right? So one of the ideas behind this dependency theory is that the, the earlier experiences of colonialism and extraction and deprivation carried forward for for decades and decades beyond, that they once set on that pathway, those countries remained poor for a very long time. So it's a long debate to be had, but I mean, there's, you know, so these global relations that we look at today have been set, those patterns have been set a very long time ago in, in terms of process of colonialism and so forth. Do we have any questions? We have two minutes. Oh, goodness. Okay. I guess we have time for one more question then. One more, anything, comment? Yes, brilliant, thank you. <laughs> um, we've, we've talked quite a lot about South America, Mexico and places like that. Uh, do you look at research into Asia and China and, and Japan and explore racism um, between uh, ethnic groups in those areas too? I mean, we... We don't have that. I mean, I work on India. Um, we don't have necessarily expertise, I and mean, we would love to. It's one of the things we'd like to do with this new institute is actually hire people to to build that expertise uh, in 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 the department. We have a lot of PhD students who work on these issues, but um, definitely, I mean, I work on India, and I think we. Um, I'm very interested in the way in which caste, for example, uh, functions as a system in very similar ways to race. And there's a long debate about that as well. But also layered onto that is currently issues around religion, which isn't necessarily about religion. It's a kind of racialization of different practices and different communities that are considered to be completely different from, from one another. So again, it's different in different parts of the world with different histories. But ideas around, you know, the way in which ideas around race evolved have spread into many different parts of the globe. So even within India, you can't speak of, of racialization practices, which I think is, is something that, you know, is really important. You had some expertise, some student working on China. Yeah, oh. Malaysia, I think. Yeah, I have a, a couple of students working on Malaysia yeah. um, and uh, Islamophobia in China mm. as well. Okay, hey, well, well, thank you very much for your time and, and your great questions, and it's really a pleasure. And I'd like to just thank all the panelists for their uh, wonderful talks uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.